As the Orch's power structure begins to crumble all around the world, the mutants strike back and win victories that they hope will finally turn the tide of battle and bring them victory. What'll happen next? Well, let's catch up on X-Men as we hop into the pages of issue number 32 and 33, shall we? All right then, so as we hop into issue number 32, we're on the island that played host to the last major mutant massacre. An old lighthouse keeper is about to be shot by an agent of Orchis after it's discovered that not only is he a surviving mutant, but actually apparently old friends with Jumbo Carnation. Thankfully, this old guy has an ace up his sleeve in the form of the returning Lockheed. Yes, that's right, Lockheed was lost, and now he's back. Let's call that X-Men storyline number 644 that they are wrapping up again at a breakneck pace. It's after that we transition on over to Emma Frost, who I dare say is maybe doing the most gangster thing I have ever seen in an X-Men comic. She's driving around New York in her limousine, doing superpowered drive-bys on Orchard goons as they attempt to execute mutants in the street. Also, she has brand new hand jewelry that literally says Hellfire on the knuckles. God damn, Emma is so freaking cool in this. When everything is said and done and the dust is finally settled and we're able to look back at the entirety of the Krakoan era with hindsight, I don't think you'll be able to find a character who was better served by these stories than Emma. Eh, well, maybe Destiny and Mystique, but you know, it's a tie for number one. Now, the White Queen isn't just driving around having fun, she's also using her psychic powers to run the war room for mutants all over the world. We check in with Magic, who has just managed to escape from Orch's custody, and now she's out for blood. Of course, she's going a lot slower than she used to, because if you'll remember, Orch's had infected her with nanomachines that made it so she couldn't teleport people. When the last Hellfire Gala came under attack, then she had a portal adventure, then she got captured, now she's free. Let's call this X-Men storyline number 645 that is now getting its big wrap-up. Magic admits there might have been a time in her life when she would have thought twice about murdering all of these Orchis goons, but hey, you know what? The council isn't really around anymore to enforce the murder no man stipulation of the Krakoan law, so I guess she can just go ham. Especially if it means being able to rescue more imprisoned mutants from an Orchis gulag. It's while making her rounds, Magic ends up coming face to face with the doctor who built the nanomachines. He's burning a bunch of Orchis paperwork, because he figures even if he does manage to survive this war, there's probably going to be a lot of Nuremberg-level trials for people like him. He's also just salty as all hell, too, here on the eve of Orchis's defeat, saying that the humans in the organization were used and betrayed by their machine counterparts, and if they had actually had a chance to run the group for real, maybe things would have been different. He also refuses to take the nanomachines out of magic, even under fear of death, because, well, some people are petty to the very end, aren't they? Even in her weakened state, Ileana is able to capture the prison security room and let loose all of the mutants who were imprisoned there. She's then joined by Shadow Cat so that they can finally wrap up the last of these goons and be done with it. As far as getting these pesky nano machines out of magic so that she can continue to help fight the good fight for mutant kind, well, they have a plan for that too, and I gotta admit, it's pretty freaking intense. You see, Shadow Cat and Magic are soon met by Polaris, fresh off destroying Orchis's space station. She's feeling pretty damn good about herself right now and even stopped off for a very well-deserved expensive coffee. Polaris says that using her magnetic ability, she can actually feel the nanomachines pulsing through magic right now, and, well, she can get them out, but it's just gonna be incredibly painful. Think Wolverine getting all the metal ripped off his bones painful. They think, hey, you know, maybe we can get a psychic to dull your senses, maybe get you some painkillers, only for Ileana to say, nah, just do it, get it over with. And they freaking do it, too, and it's really bloody and brutal. You know what? I guess magic is also freaking gay gangster too. She should get her own mutant name tattooed across her stomach in Old English after this. Issue 32 ultimately ends up having a happy ending too, as both Shadowcat and Magic get picked up by Emma in her limo saying, hey, hop in, we're gonna go bash the fash. But first, hey, here's your pet dragon. Aw, so sweet. Now, that was all fun and entertaining, but issue 33 actually ends up being a lot more substantial. You see, we flash back to a meeting being held between Sebastian Shaw and and Shinobi Shaw, his son. Sebastian says that should everything go tits up in this upcoming war, Shaw has been sure to put a little contingency in place. Basically, he's put aside some very important land in Madripoor that he plans to take control of and bunker down on until the heat's off. Of course, he has to send Shinobi to get the land, and it's here you might be reminded, oh yeah, didn't the Morlocks open a bar there? Wasn't there a whole storyline? About the mutants getting all involved in Madripoor real estate? Well, it's 
back now and we can call it X-Men storyline number 647. That they're now finally seeing fit to tie up and also hey the Reavers are sent by Shinobi to try and capture the area from Calypso and her people. In fact I'm pretty sure the X-Men fought the Reavers originally for this land so everything's coming full circle. We're reminded once again that Emma Frost is using her psychic powers to run the back end of all these different mutant battles happening all over the globe right now and we get to peek in on some of them. Including but not limited to hey look at Secret Empire Steve Rogers who was actually the secret bad guy of that new Uncanny Avengers mini. And even Wolverine defending the new X-Men's base of operations inside the Morlock tunnels by cutting the ever-loving crap out of a bunch of poor Orch's agents who are set in there because really let's face it Wolverine killing people in the sewers goes together like peanut butter and chocolate. Emma even says man it's good to have someone as savage as Wolverine on our side here. It's been a long time since he's been allowed to cut loose like this. Everyone who's left over including Shadowcat are sent to Madripoor though to aid Calypso and the rest of the Morlocks which actually ends up being a pretty easy task as the Reavers were never actually that much of a threat to begin with. It's here that Shinobi Shaw ends up coming out of the shadows looking to make a deal with the rest of the X-Men. Apparently he learned duplicity from the Master. And he figures the best way to save his own skin is by giving up his dad's ultimate trump card. You see Sebastian Shaw used his considerable wealth and power to ferry away Dr. Devo. The idea being that if Orchis won the war, Devo would have enough technology and resources to restart the entire organization and if the mutants won, Shaw could trade him to the mutants and end up looking like a hero in the process. Now even though Devo was always shown to basically be a puppet leader since all of this began, he is still ultimately pretty dangerous, more so in fact as it seems he's stolen a bunch of Reed Richards portal tech. His own personal plan being if he can't kill all of mutant kind then he'll do the next best thing and just send them all off to the negative zone or somewhere equally terrible. An entire X-Men strike team is sent to deal with Devo unfortunately. A lot of the old tricks just won't work on this old guy. Omega Sentinel scooped out his brain a long time ago, meaning that he's just a robot who doesn't even know he's a robot, so psychic attacks are out. And it's not like Wolverine or the others can exactly fight while being sucked inside another dimension. It's because of that Kamala Khan ends up rolling the dice by placing a call to Doctor Doom. Yeah, remember how Doom and Latveria had their own X-Men team and it looked like that was going to be really important at one point, but I guess now we'll just call it X-Men storyline number 6 Four, eight, that they once again hope to try and tie up in this issue. Doom is ultimately goaded into helping the X-Men because, hey, purging the entire world with portals, that's his shtick, and also you just can't steal Reed Richards' technology. I was planning to steal his technology. The Lotvarian X-Men come on in to make the save using the full force of their power to make quick work of Dr. Devo completely exterminating him, meaning that Orchis has lost basically all of their major power players. Hell, Wolverine even congratulates Doom's adopted daughter saying she did an amazing job. They turned down any offer to join the X-Men only for Logan to say, yeah, I turned them down a long time ago too and look what happened. Oh, but wait, we're not done yet because as the comic comes to a close, the rest of the team hears a psychic distress call from Cyclops who is currently getting the crap knocked out of him by Nimrod in his brand new body. It would seem with their back against the wall, Orchis is employing their final Hail Mary play, a massive mechanical doomsday device called the Sentinel City. What is it? What does it do? I don't know. You're probably going to have to read Follow the House of X to find out. And so that was X-Men issue number 32 and 33, everybody. And honestly, I'm much happier that I waited and recorded these two videos back to back because they're ultimately a lot more fulfilling when you do it that way. Oh, don't get me wrong. A lot of the problems I've had about the current crop of X-Men books still persist here. Mainly, it feels like this book and X-Men Forever aren't actually being written for people like us who read the book month to month. It feels like it's being written for the collected edition and for someone who's going to come in and read all of this for the first time without Fall of the House of X and Rise of Powers of X to spoil them. Beyond that, everything else is perfectly fine and acceptable. I'm glad all of these different storylines are actually getting wrapped up. It just feels weird to see them all get wrapped up in such rapid fire order. Especially when I'm always going to be sitting here and wondering about what could have been. Jeez, they even joke in this issue that Doom's new X-Men team could have been called the new X-Men. Which feels like if the whole X-Men X-Men 97 from Ashes Media Blitz wasn't coming down the pipeline already, that probably was going to be a book we would have got a chance to read at some point. Taken together though, I think I would give these two issues a 7 out of 10. There's fun stuff here, there's answers to questions here, there's cool character moments. But it all just feels like it's happening in a vacuum and it kind of impacts my 
my general enjoyment of it. Hey there everyone, it's your pal Cape Jewel again, and if you're seeing my face right now, that means you watched at the end of the video, and I'll always be grateful for that. Retention helps in this crazy YouTube game, and so does becoming a patron. If you head on down to the description, you can find a link to my Patreon page. Recently just redid all the tiers, a lot of cool stuff offering up there, exclusive commentaries, exclusive polls, uh, behind the scenes concept art for Capes and Quest, that's the brand new D&D show I've started soon. Never been a better time to become a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month and help the channel grow and you know help me continue to deliver content like what you just saw so i want to thank you all and i will see you again next time bye bye